Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on polymerization and this is topic 20 for the CIE um, specification, so that's the Cambridge Internationals. Um, so in this video, as you'd probably expect, we're going to talk about polymers and polymerization um, for the year one side of it. Obviously, there is polymerization in year two as well, which goes into different types of polymers um there's the full range obviously this is just topic 20 but the full range of topics for cie for the full a level is on allery chemistry on the youtube channel um i would massively appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button just to show your support for this project that would be really good um obviously these slides are um you are able to purchase these as well if you wish to have a copy yourself um, the link is in the description box below they're great value for money i've bundled them together as well um, to try and um, make it a bit easier to kind of administer so but you can buy the full um, a level uh, specification on um, on the test shop so just click on the link there and you'll be able to find them there okay so let's have a look at this which is obviously polymerization now in the year one specification we only look at addition polymers um, there are condensation polymerization reactions um, but that's left for year two so this is obviously relatively short topic this one um but um obviously nonetheless very important um there's a lot of uses as well of polymers and and the kind of um kind of environmental side in this topic so alkenes um so addition polymers should we say are made from alkenes so as the name suggests addition polymers we add different um kind of components to form the polymer so alkenes are the ones that we use for addition polymers and these are monomers and a monomer is a single unit um, and they join together to form addition polymers so polymers can be made from monomer units the monomers are the kind of the kind of smaller blocks that make up the long chain and they can be natural such as proteins and natural rubber um, or they can be synthetic like poly uh, like polythene and polypropene um, so you've got loads of different um, types of reactions here but we'll well like I say we are going to look at um, the addition polymers here so polymers have been actually used for a while um, and one of the first polymers that was actually discovered and still used today to an extent um, is in 1844 a chap called Charles Goodyear and some people might have heard of this person before um, he discovered vulcanized rubber and basically he added chemicals to natural rubber um, which was obviously quite brittle and didn't really have good properties and he made obviously um, harder wearing rubber tires uh, harder wearer rubbing that uh, rubber that he used to make tires and obviously they're still around today because you might have heard of Goodyear tires so um, it was thanks to somebody like him who discovered actually you could create um, polymers synthetic polymers so obviously in the last hundred years polymers have been developed such as polyethane so polythene for example nylon teflon and these polymers have obviously revolutionized the way we live obviously plastics are everywhere down to the microphone that we're speaking into here the clothes that i'm wearing you know the desk that i'm actually sitting on here everything is made of plastic of some shape or form and obviously new polymers have been synthesized all the time um, and obviously this brings a about new kind of technologies obviously to smart watches that i've, that I've actually got on now and you can't see us but um smart watches that you've got plus um you know kind of um smartphones obviously with your, your touch screen now you can get ones where you know at the time of filming you can get phones where you can fold them in half with a kind of continuous screen on them so these technologies are advancing quite rapidly so to make um, a polymer like polypropene for example we need the monomer propene and we need to add a few of these together to form polypropene so let's have a look at the monomer first so the monomer is the unit that makes up the polymer so the monomer here is propene um, it's got the double bond and it's that double bond that opens up to form the polymer chain in total so there it is there so you can see we've opened that double bond and what you'll notice is we have an n on the side there as you can see so the n means repeat units so that is a repeat unit there so this bit here 
is a repeat unit so that repeats over and over and over to form your polymer and n just means there's lots of them basically um the this is one repeat unit um now notice the double bond isn't actually there anymore so that doesn't exist and you have trailing bonds as well now it's really important that you put these trailing bonds in here so when they ask for a repeat unit you must draw it like this with no double bond in there you have square brackets with trailing bonds and an n basically means you have a multiple repeat units for this now obviously when you join these together you form a polymer now this is a diagram showing two repeat units so you can see you've got one and you've got two so the exam board might ask you to draw a specific number of repeat units just make sure you're kind of drawing your trailing bonds your square brackets and you obviously um, draw the correct number of trailing uh, of, uh, sorry the correct number of repeat units in there so polyalkenes are saturated molecules so they don't have any double bonds in there okay they're normally non-polar so there's kind of no not much polarity there and they're not very reactive either and for this reason addition polymers like this actually don't degrade very well in landfill whatsoever so this is just an example of an addition polymer anything which is an ethene or an alkene um, these can open up that double bond they'll ask you may ask you to, to draw a repeat unit and obviously the how many repeat units they want you to draw so because they don't degrade very well um, that means they're quite robust but they cause a problem environmentally which we'll look at later but we can add um, plasticizers to polymers and actually change the properties um, of that polymer altogether so plasticizers actually make polymers more flexible um, and plasticizers obviously they they slide between the polymer chains imagine these polymers you've got loads of chains they're all stacked up on top of each other um, and what they do is they push the chain the chains kind of a little bit further apart that weakens the intermolecular forces between these polymer chains and they can then slide over each other a little bit more easily and that means you can bend or twist that polymer into whatever shape you wish so plasticizers they're commonly used to change say the properties of pvc which might be poly uh, polychloroethene for example um so that was well, polyvinyl chloride but it's the same thing so there's your chloroethene which is there so there's your double bond and um, we add the um obviously we open that double bond up and we form our repeat unit which is here um, now PVC is obviously made from very long loosely packed polymer chains okay so there's loads and loads of polymer chains but they're not kind of arranged in a nice nice neat arrangement um, now they are hard and brittle and so they're used in drain pipes as you can see so they do have their uses but when we add a plasticizer to them to so the same plastic we basically add molecules between the the polymer chain that makes them a bit more flexible and slide over each other and then we can make um say um, electrical insulation so cable so insulation for electrical cables so you know that this property here would be different to that one same plastic you've just added a plasticizer in there okay so the really important part of plastic and it's obviously quite topical um is waste and plastics um cause a lot of problems and um, they obviously solve a lot of problems in terms of the kind of things that we have around us but at, when they're kind of finished with and they're disposed of they do cause issues in terms of the environmental side of them so most polymers are not actually biodegradable and your addition polymers generally aren't um, so you need to be really careful with how you dispose of them so landfill is really good for disposing of plastics that are um, well it's useful for not good I mean so it's useful um, for disposal of plastics that are really difficult to recycle sometimes they're not recyclable they're too difficult to separate from other materials so it might be in say um, for example it might be in television units where there's metals in there and all sorts of other things or there's not enough plastic to actually make it economically viable so it's like a little plastic toy for example it just isn't worth it <coughs> excuse me okay so landfill obviously it's not a very sustainable way of disposing um of products um and obviously you need a large amount of land to do that land is becoming increasingly more expensive and it costs money to dispose of items you can't just dispose of things where you want for obvious reasons um you need a licensed premises to do that and the cost of that is increasing to try and deter people from actually just throwing things away um 
So there is a need to reduce our reliance on landfill in this day and age. So let's have a look at some of the polyalkene properties. Um, like I say, the intermolecular forces do govern the properties of polymers, as we mentioned before. So most alkene chains are non-polar, so they really only have these weak van der Waals forces between the chains. Obviously, the longer the chain and the closer they are to each other, then the more van der Waals forces you have. So remember, the van der Waals forces is the weakest type of intermolecular force that you can have. So polymer chains, um, which are shorter and have a lot of branching, so in other words, they've got kind of groups sticking out from the chain, as we've seen before, they tend to be a little bit more flexible and they're a bit weaker. They're not as strong as, say, straight chain alkanes. And this is because they actually have a low density. Okay, so for example, polyethene or polythene. So polymers with no or very little branching um, tend to be a little bit more rigid, they're stronger, they can pack together a little bit easier, so there's no bits of groups kind of sticking out of the polymer chain to make it difficult to kind of compact together. So it's a bit like sheets of paper, so a straight chain alkane would be like a flat sheet of paper and stack loads of them together, whereas branching would be like cardboard boxes. So there's a lot of empty space in between them, but obviously you can't pack these boxes together as, as easily if there's bulky bits sticking out of them. So some polyalkenes um, have halogens in them. So for example, PVC. Um, and obviously they can form stronger permanent dipole-dipole forces. Um, and obviously these offer very different properties to your standard um, polyalkenes, for example, which um, don't have these halogens, which um, mainly they only... well they just have van der Waals forces which are weaker so obviously the properties of of polymers with polar molecules in there or, or um, dipoles permanent dipoles will have more like to have stronger and more robust properties than ones which don't okay so most obviously polymers like we say are not biodegradable and we do have to think about how they're recycled carefully as I, as I mentioned before um, so most plastics, like I say, are made from crude oil. It's a non-renewable source. Um, and obviously there is a massive push to try and get people to um, recycle more and or reuse it more or maybe, you know, upcycle it or, you know, just do something different with it other than throwing it into landfill. Uh, and it means we're reducing our dependency on crude oil if we are recycling materials like this. So some plastics like polypropene, these can be remoulded into new objects, for example. Um, and obviously other plastics, like we've seen before previously, they can be cracked. So this was in the alkanes um, topic. Um, they can be cracked and the polymer chain can be broken up into monomers and it can be used for other organic feedstocks um, or plastics for other substances. So in other words, we can use the kind of the kind of cracked product to make other materials completely different from plastic. So the technology is, is evolving, you know, and has been for quite a few years now in terms of what can we do with the plastic that we've already got? Can we just use it for something completely different? Even if it means not just melting it down and making new plastics, can we make other stuff with it as well? So another way of doing of getting rid of plastics is through incineration. This is burning. Um, now this can be used. It can be beneficial in the fact that the energy used to burn the plastics can be used to generate electricity. So you kind of there is some good out of it. Obviously the downside um, is the um, pollutants. So when you burn a plastic, you actually do release a lot of toxic fumes. Um, and obviously we've got to make sure these are monitored, either collected, disposed of, neutralized, etc. So for example, PVC, if you burn PVC or set fire to it, then it can produce um, HCl gas, which is acidic and is, is just not good for you whatsoever. So this is why you shouldn't just be burning plastics, um, you know, just as and when you see fit. You should never burn them in the open air anyway. So like I say, in industry, it's a bit more controlled um, and you can use flue gas scrubbers to neutralize any acidic gases that are produced when they do do this. Um, and obviously they can fire a gas, uh, a base, sorry, at the acidic gases that could be produced, for example, when you burn um, PVC. <coughs> okay, apologies for this. I've got a bit of hair fever, so and it's starting to show through just when I'm talking. 
Um, right. So, um, just finally, um, obviously there is there is a lot of um, scientists working on plastics and how we can make them a little bit more sustainable if we are if we do have to use plastics. And one of the ways is biodegradable polymers. Um, now these can decompose naturally. Um, now, given certain conditions, they will be decomposed by obviously the oxygen and other organisms that are around. So biodegradable polymers um, are made from both oil fractions and renewable sources, so we can make them from, from both. Um, so, for example, you have starch-based pl uh, polymers, which is quite interesting because obviously that's made from potatoes. Um, they're more expensive than non-biodegradable products, though, so we've got to be careful for that. Um, and obviously, if you want the plastic to biodegrade, you need a good supply of oxygen and moisture for them to do that. Um, and obviously, if you don't have that, then the plastics won't degrade at all. And obviously, we can use um, biodegradable plastics in frost protective sheets for plants, which is really quite smart. So they're made from polyethane um, and um, starch grains as well. And over time, microorganisms actually break down that polymer sheeting, meaning that you don't actually have to dispose of it. So you can get these large polytunnels with food and, and crops kind of grown into it, but you only need that to protect the plants and the crop from over a period of time. And then polymer tunnels, them sheets can degrade over time and then you just replace them with new ones. But what you're not doing is putting these polymers in a landfill and that's why they're so valuable. Plus it saves a bit of time as well. So obviously the advantage is crude oil doesn't need to be used, which is non-renewable, so we're not extracting um, crude oil from the ground and doing that another advantage is obviously plant-based polymers they degrade um, they release carbon dioxide um, now this is absorbed by plants to make the polymer in the first place so it's relatively um, you know relatively sustainable and obviously over the product's lifetime um, plant-based polymers use a lot less energy than oil-based ones you're not having to heat things up and crack them and get your products from there so you know there is a big push to try and use plant-based polymers and technology is moving on and we can imagine over the next decade especially you're going to have a very different type of plastic that's used i know in the supermarket that um the nearest supermarket to me is morrison's they use paper bags instead of plastic bags so so there is a push to try and move away even for these kind of reusable bags to use paper ones instead Okay, so that's it. Like I say, it was quite a short topic, and really we're just looking at addition polymers here. Like I say, there's a full range of um, CIE A-level videos on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Please hit the subscribe button to show your support for this project. I would massively appreciate that. And like I say, if you wish to purchase these slides, they are available to purchase. Just click on the link in the description box below. You'll be able to get a hold of them there. They're great value for money, and again, the full range of A-level slides are on there too. Right, um, that's it. Hope that was helpful. Bye-bye.